I'm Scott Chapman. I'm a scientist at CSIRO based in Brisbane and uh, work on wheat amongst a few other things. But <clears throat> today I'm talking about wheat and um, I'll try and elaborate with some examples in wheat on the, the story that I'm sure Graham told you about sorghum. Um, but unfortunately, I was in a, a wheat initiative meeting, so I kind of missed that. So if I overlap a little bit with Graham, I apologise. So I thought I'd start, Lee told me he told people we were going to talk about drones or as we call them here, rem RPAs, remotely piloted aircraft, because drones have a nasty um, and a <coughs> connotation due to the way that they're used by some foreign governments. And so the, um, I thought I'll introduce it, but then I'll go back to the topics that you saw. So this is a, a composite picture that was collected in 10 minutes with a small $1,000 drone with a $10,000 camera hanging underneath it <laughs> and um, uploaded to the company who built the camera. And they have an automated system to process this and it works rather well, as I hope you'll see. Um, this collects information at a ground sampling distance of about three centimetres. At 50 metres, if I flow lower, I can get more than that. Um, it'll be a bit slow, it depends on how good the <coughs> internet is. You can see we're running a trial here where we're taking repeated harvests and then we've got these <coughs> plots here that we'll be doing a plot harvest and also some final harvests on. But the more interesting thing is, and actually it is a higher resolution than that, you can't see it because of the way I'm zooming here. But So it's a five spectrum camera and so you're seeing um, you can do a calculation of the NDVI on a pixel basis. So that's every pixel. So the same kind of thing you can do with those $1,000 Canon vegetation stress cameras that the KSU team are using in Jesse's project. But these are much higher, and I'll show you later, <coughs> these are much finer cameras in terms of the resolution of the, the spectra. So the data are, are a lot more higher quality. And the other good thing is that the processing that is done because it adjusts for the reflectance of, of the conditions under which you do the measurement, you can look at them over time. So you can go and jump to another date um, and they're perfectly aligned and they're comparable between dates. So I won't spend too much time on that because it's quicker to stay on the same one. Um, the other thing you'll get, you get a, a red edge um, calculation. So it's got five channels. Um, I'll just skip straight to this, which is a, a digital surface model, which allows you to estimate height. Now, the only issue is you've just got a mosaic, so you've got to process this somehow. And I'll show you what we've been doing recently to achieve that. Um, I might just leave that loading because it seems a bit slow. So following on from what, so I'll come back to the UAV stuff unless we don't have any time, in which case we just won't do it. Uh, I want to talk about modelling wheat phenology. We've done a fair bit of work on this in the last five years or so. And first I want to make some general points which probably relate back to things Graham said and, and things that, that Corinne will probably mention, I expect, on, is it Wednesday? I guess the next session for this? Wednesday? Yeah. So it, it's important, I think, to think about where modelling adds value to breeding and the fact that certainly in the, in the groups that we've worked together in Australia, we've spent a lot of time asking what breeders do and making sure we understand what breeders do so that you add value to the breeding, not that you just come along with a model and say, oh, I can do everything or I can do this, um, and then be told, well, so what? I'm not really interested in that. So I guess the things where we've done a fair bit of work is in environment characterization, which Corinne will talk about, um, prediction of trait values, so trying to look at what types of traits are valuable in what kind of environments, and I'm going to give you an example of that for flowering time, even though it's a fairly simple trait. Um, phenotype assessment, um, that's, and I won't talk about that today, but that's where we're trying to integrate our models with your phenotypic platforms so that we calculate new phenotypes from the data that's observed. So I think, Graham, did you mention any of that stuff? Maybe? You know, tracking ground cover and feeding that back into the model 
No, but anyway, so you can you can you could track the 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 nitrogen content, the ground cover of the of an actual field um, using that kind of mosaics and things I showed you. You could feed it into a model, and then you would sort of backward calculate characteristics of the the genotype from that. So you've got a certain amount of known information. It's a bit like the sorghum, tillerine, and flowering time example, except that you could do even more complex things by feeding it with a phenotype that you've measured over the over the season. Um, genetic trait value I won't talk about. So <coughs> all those areas of work, of uh, areas that we've worked in in, in sorghum or wheat, um, environment characterization, in season phenotyping, prediction across the, the nation, and genetic trait value. So these are simulations of landscapes for sorghum where if you had all of the genes available to you as a breeder, um, there are four dimensions there. You can see one, two on each plot, and then one, two in the big, um, on the, <coughs> the large axes. Those are the yields of every genotype that you could create with all of these, with these four traits across a realistic set of trait values. Those are the yields in 10 successive years. So that's just cycling around. And it's really just to indicate if, if red is a high yield, that in any given year, the highest yielding genotype has quite different trait composition um, in Australian environments. This is in one location. So it's a major adaptation challenge for sorghum breeders and for wheat breeders is trying to select stuff because the environments are changing while you're trying to do selection. But not only that, the best genotype for the environment is never going to be the best in every year or the every place. It just cannot possibly happen in our environments. And this allows us to assess all of the risks around that and then connect that into genetic models. <coughs> but I'm going to go with a simple example, which is about wheat phenology. Uh, Matthew's already talked a bit about that this morning as a challenge for, for adaptation. I'm talking, uh, uh, talking about it as an opportunity for adaptation. So I think everybody in the room, I'm sure, knows something about flowering time is everything in wheat, particularly in rain-fed environments. So in our environments, we've got a major challenge that we can't control the sowing date because we've got to wait for it to rain. Um, and we're not really sure what's going to happen during the season because we're completely rain-fed. So we're growing partly on stored water. Um, in the northern region, in this sort of anywhere north of, well, a bit north of here, actually, um, wheat production is very much driven by um, stored soil water, so there's not much rain during winter from Dubbo north. Uh, whereas in the southern region, you get most of your rain during the winter in sporadic amounts, but then there's none after about September. So it stopped raining already, um, in, well, not in Sydney, but in, in those places. So you've got, and then you've got to deal with frost and heat, so you've got to avoid the frost. You want to flower late enough to avoid the frost, and then the heat usually kicks in about three weeks later, so you'd, <laughs> you'd want to try and avoid the heat. And the drought may or may not be there, depending on what soil you're on and what season you had. So trying to get the flowering time right is a challenge. But if we can look across large numbers of, of um, <coughs> years using the weather data, we can look at what would be the on average optimal flowering time and how do we achieve it. So just to give you some perspective, these are percentages of years with frost stress. And you can see that in the eastern wheat belt, uh, you get frost every year. The only places you really don't get much frost are in these maritime environments in South Australia and in the north and the south of the western belt. So they don't really have much of a frost challenge. There's a couple of places in the north that don't, don't get frost anymore. 50 years ago, you used to get frost in Emerald, but you don't really get it anymore. Um, but you can see mainly for the eastern area, there's a big challenge. And I'll talk more about this on a, a paper on, uh, when is it? Tuesday, I think. Did you say how many years? <coughs> oh, that one's back to 1957, I think. It's, that's the last 50 years. And the, so the last frost day, so this is at the 90th percentile. You can see how it changes with the geography. So. The sowing date, sorry, the flowering date that you need to avoid frost in this part of the world, up in Queensland, Sydney's down here. So this, that's about, I don't know, 2,000 kilometres away. Um, you, you only really need to get into 
early to mid-July and you'll avoid the frost. Uh, unless you're down on the, the wheat belt, the, sorry, the southern downs, you'll, you'll have frost out to the end of August. Uh, and as you come further down, you'll see there's some these areas directly west of here where the frosts are continuing to the end of September. <coughs> and you similarly see some patterns in the west. Um, we've just recently published a paper on this. Corinne's a lead author on it with the uh, postdoc, Bang Yu Zeng. Um, that's in, is that Jake's bot, Corinne? Yes, so it's, <laughs> and it's out. So if you look for ZHENG. Uh, JX bot on frost. Um, Corinne and Bang Yu did a big analysis of the whole country looking at probabilities of frost and how they change uh, with flowering date. And then you've got this first heat day which is occurring two or three weeks later. So in the future, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but the question we've been asking is whether current wheat varieties are suitable for future climates in Australia. And one of the things to keep in mind, I won't elaborate much here, is that even though our, you know, our environments have warmed by about one and a half degrees or so over the last 50 years and they're predicted to do the same again, the fact that that's happened doesn't mean that we've necessarily shifted the frequency of frost. So we've also had a lot of drying of environments, particularly in the west, and they've actually, as they warmed up, they experienced just as much frost as ever, or even more, because they dried out as well. So if you've got these dry, clear nights, you've got a higher incidence of a radiative frost or radiation frost. So, it's, it's, so you've got two problems going on. One, the general warming of the winter is accelerating your development, so you'll flower earlier if you plant the same variety now than, and in 50 years, but your frost risk might not change very much. So that means you've still got to maintain that late flowering day, which means essentially you need a variety that's later than it was or in today's conditions. So how do you do that and how much do you have to shift it? So um, <coughs> I've given some of the references on this that we've, we've worked on. So we built a model to quantify uh, the effects of VRN1 and PPDD1, the major spring wheat alleles that we work with. Um, <coughs> to, to be able to simulate flowering date and to account for these major effects on flowering time, fertilisation, photoperiod and earliness per se, which is just the response to temperature per se. Um, I think Graham <coughs> had, would have given you an outline of the APSIM cropping systems model. I won't spend much time on that, but we can, obviously if we're able to model the genetic effects on flowering time and use those as parameters for genotypes, we can feed that into the model and simulate the yield in any particular soil or water or climate condition um, that those apply. So I thought I'll mention, because I probably won't have much time to say talk about this during the, the, um, the talk at the IWC, but uh, just to give you a flavour of how it's, it's modelled, in fact, our modelling of flowering time is, is based pretty much on the series wheat models. We've modified them a bit. Um, we don't worry about snow as an effect, for example. So, <laughs> so actually, snow is still in the APSIM model, but we, are, we don't usually need it. Although, when we have tried to run the model in Europe, it still does work reasonably well. So, <laughs> so the, the, the reason that snow is in there was to model the effects of um, low temperatures on on vernalisation and, and suppressing winter weeds. So it's still in there, but we don't need it. So the model is essentially looking at um, development to floral initiation as a function of temperature, but as modified by vernalisation and photoperiod. So this delta TT you might be familiar with is just the change in thermal time. So you can calculate that as a function of the, the daily temperatures, the max and min. I'll explain that in a minute, and <laughs> is multiplied by, the, in APSIM, the current version, the minimum of a vernalisation and a photoperiod effect, and then by these other effects which are related to water, nitrogen and phosphorus, which typically are turned off in the model, in fact, we don't turn them on. When you see delays in, or sorry, sometimes you see acceleration in phenology when you've got water stress, and that 
really is usually due to the fact that the soil surface is hotter than, the, than in, in a dried environment than it is in, a, in an irrigated or wet environment. Um, so <coughs> as long as your temperature is picking up that effect, then you'll pick it up. You don't really need an additional calculation to do it. But the problem is <coughs> you have to, and APSIM does model the, the surface soil temperature. Uh, we don't always use it in all of our predictions. It's one of those areas that we're sort of investigating how much we need to keep an eye on that um, at the moment. So then you have these, these um, multipliers for vernalization photo period, and they're basically sensitivities. So to explain the thermal time first, there's your snow coefficient. So this is to calculate the, the, the maximum temperature of the crown and the minimum temperature of the crown. And then it has a response to crown temperature across, <coughs> across this temperature range so that you can see that maximum development rate occurs at about, I think that's 28 degrees or so. So as soon as the temperature, the, the, that's, as soon as the temperature goes above 28, it would start slowing down. Um, <coughs> it's supposed to be calculated on a, an hourly or three hourly basis. We found in the model that there Someone had sort of overlooked that at some point, but well, I think we've corrected it by now. But what you do is for every day, you take the weather data and you calculate this thermal time unit and it accumulates towards a target. So you, you, for a particular genotype, you can set a target and say, well, when I get to 400 degree days, I'm at floral initiation. And so you're just accumulating, say, 10 per day. It'll take 40 days. Is that average day <coughs> Um, well, it's using these functions to calculate the, so it is averaged, it's crown, sorry, it's, so the crown is the average of, it accumulates the average of the crown maximum and crown minimum as estimated by this equation. So there's a slight adjustment. <coughs> Basically they add two degrees to it. Awesome. Yeah. Um, then for, so that's the temperature sign. And for photo periods, you can get these different kinds of responses. So if you look at day length, you get a photo period factor, which if it was one, it means that there's, there's no response at all. Um, so it, it just won't respond. Um, and here, if you have a level of five, you're gonna get this, this um, response that starts at a day length of 10 and goes up to 16. 18 hours, so beyond 18 hours, you won't see any photo period effects. And so that, the thing, the key parameter is this one, the RP, um, that, that number is the one that would vary with genotype. <coughs> um, Vernalisation, you have a similar kind of response and, and if you guys want to look at all these equations and stuff, well, you can either read them off here or we can give you the original papers for these. Um, but there's a vernalization response. So the key thing for us in, in this research was, well, we need to characterize this for a large number of Australian genotypes and work out what is the potential response and how well will that adapt to current and future climates. <coughs> I'll skip over that. So if you do a this type of field experiment. I don't know how many people are familiar with these kinds of experiments. So this is one that Ben Bidoff did at NWA. He's got a whole lot of fluoro light tubes there where he's extending the, he just turned them on at four o'clock in the afternoon, leave them on till midnight and get 16 hour days. Um, turn them off at, at the right time in the morning or 18 hours days, I should say. And we actually use um, floodlights to do this. Um, and I forgot to put a slide in here. I, I, I only just remembered it. Um, last week, I took a really nice photo. We, we grew, this year we weren't doing any of these experiments. So we have floodlights on poles that are about, <coughs> at about the height of the ceiling actually. And they're lighting, there's two, two floodlights here and two floodlights here and they're lighting an area for these experiments. And, Every scientist who was anywhere near our lights trial would be worried that their wheat or something was going to respond to our lights. So this year, I planted the same genotype across the whole experiment, 
And last week I took a beautiful photo, actually last Tuesday I took a beautiful photo, which I should, <coughs> it's probably on my computer, to show you this nice ring of flowering wheat around my big lights trial. So, and I can tell you there's not a single plant flowering outside of 12 metres from those lights. It's just, and we're going to go and measure the light intensity just to validate it. I mean, it's published. But, you know, you can see this thing from a kilometre away. Well, not a half. You're driving down a highway past the university. You can see the lights, and they're more than half a K from the, from the road. And you go, wow, those lights are bright. But when you go over there, the plants aren't noticing that. There's, <laughs> there's, there's a wheat crop that's about 20 metres away, and it's not flowering. It was planted on the same day. And so I just planted a uniformity trial. I'm taking lots of photos of it. I'm going to make a 3D model of it. I'm going to put it somewhere. And next time someone asks me whether I should, you know, oh, Scott, I don't want you to run your photo bigger trial because it might affect my experiment. No, it won't affect it. If it's more than 12 metres away, it won't affect it. Um, so it, it really, you've got to, it doesn't need much light intensity, but it needs more than your eyes think it needs. Scott, so the same thing goes for eyes <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 there's 12 metres for his rust trial, no chance. <laughs> and I need about two kilometres away from those bloody crown rock trials, so... <laughs> I know how fast the nematodes can crawl. <laughs> so, we do an experiment where we vernalise the seed, we pre-imbibe it for eight weeks, and, and we also extend the day length. And from this, um, Bung Yu did a really nice global analysis, which we won't get into, but we simplified it down to the vernalization response being a function of the, the number of um, winter alleles. So we only did it for winter and spring. We didn't try and do every winter allele and spring allele that's been identified. We took 200, I think the trial that we, you just saw had over 200 Australian varieties in it, historical and current and really represented the diversity of Australian germplasm. And we found that the vernalisation effect of A1 was about half of what it was of the other two. So we, this equation is not the fitted one. We fitted one, and it was so close to 0.3 and 2 that we just put those numbers in. Um, and for photo period, we found similarly that the vern B1 had about half the effect of A1 and D1. So it's, it's, um, you, it's got that multiplier on it. To, to adjust it up. <clears throat> and then the, there's an interaction with PPD D1. So for the photo period effect, we've actually built an interaction with vernalization and photo period um, into, the, into the model. <clears throat> so this is some results from the heading time model. You can go and look at the paper. This is the, the fit on the, the natural data. This is the fit on the, the vernalization and photo period plus photo period data. So you can see they all flowered earlier, but we pick up a fair bit of this. But the thing is, I think the thing that was nice about this work is we didn't fit it on the basis of genotype by genotype. We didn't try to fit 200 genotypes. We, we globally fitted the major genes and then had a residual. And that gave us, I think, a lot more power. It also gave us more predictive power because we could then put those genes, all we need to know is those genes um, to, to run the model. So the situation we're in now, and I'll talk more about this on Tuesday, is that if we know the major genes that are in a, a new genotype and we do at least one experiment with a Vern and photo period effect to work out its base response, we can predict its flowering time pretty well across the country now in, in these spring weeks. In fact, we don't even need to do the photo period vernalization trial. If a breeder can give us some diverse sowing date experiments, we can derive the parameters for the specific genotype, subtracting the major gene effects and doing the prediction. And we've done it, it works quite well. Um, <clears throat> maybe it just means there's not a lot of diversity. This is the validation, so, so all this work, with, the, all the model was development was done on that, that blue dot there, which had 200, oh, there you go, 170, no, it had over 200 lines, I think it was 220 something. So we, we did the model development on that, and then we went and found every trial we could get our hands on, which ended up with, um, I think, more than, uh, this number is actually well over 5,000 observations now across the whole country where people had observed heading date, and this is 
these are all of these data sets together. Now you can see this, of course, there's, this is not perfect. And, and Matthew might say, you know, regarding Siri Babax, we're not really within the range of that because you can see that we can be out by up to 10 days there. But I assure you that if you plot the genotypes on these, we're, we're down around, well, the RMSC on this is about four days, but we're, we're below that on a lot of the gen genotypes. So when you grow genotypes across diverse set of environments, we can predict their flowering dates pretty well. And again, on Tuesday, I'll talk more about it, but we're looking at whether we can use SNP data alone to predict flowering date anywhere in the country. And we can, sort of, so for a region. So if you want to know whether a SNP profile will give you something that's responsive and early or late in a given sowing date and region, we can do that now. So, but it, we can't predict a particular trial in a particular year perfectly, but we can give you the ranking or where that germplasm would be in that area. <coughs> so this is just to explain the result a little bit more. Um, I just let me explain this for a second. So if we planted on the 1st of May, so say it rained on the, I don't know, 25th of April and the soil dried out and you went and sowed your, um, your wheat experiment or your wheat uh, field, then if you had a genotype like um, Bolac, which is a late one, you'd expect over 50 years that the median flowering date would be about the, the first week of, or well, second week of September, right, for that sowing date? Am I on the right one? Yeah, there. But in 50 years, Bolac could have flowered as early as mid-August or as late as almost the end of September. That's how much range you'll get just because of temperature on that sowing date. So this is what we call the optimum flowering window for frost and heat because this purple, this pink line here is the last frost day probability. So <clears throat> below, beyond uh, about the 3rd of September, your probability of frost is less than 10%. But beyond about the 1st of October, your probability of heat is <coughs> over 30%. So this is, a, oh, sorry, over 10%. It's over 30% it's over by mid-October. So we sort of give a bit more flex in the, in the heat window. We run it through 30% heat rather than 10% because frost obviously is much more damaging at flowering than, than heat. Heat doesn't completely wipe it out, which frost does. So you really want to be somewhere early in this window. And so what it lets you do, well, the model already let you do this, was to choose which of these maturity types will land you in that window depending on what your sowing time is. And, and so we've done this for the whole country. We put it on the web. You can click on it. You can go and find it and, and use that as a tool. And it's, we're not the first people to do that. It's been done for a while in Australia that, that breeders have been, uh, sorry, that farmers have been able to do this. Um, what we did, which was new, was to be able to do this based on genetics and give a much bigger range. Again, I don't want to steal everything from Tuesday, so I'm not going to show you all of it. <coughs> but one of the things that we did was we said, well, what if we could create every combination of genotype from all of the, from those three genes and from the range of base thermal times that we had? We had about 400 genotypes. What would their um, yields be over 50 years if we sowed them anywhere from March to July? And so this is, again, for one location. And you can see that now, this has been very much driven by the supply of water, right? This is the dynamic of water supply that Graham talked about for sorghum. This is for wheat. <laughs> and you can see that, um, and this is with the, the frost and heat effect turned off in the model. You can see it's really, it's a little bit unfortunate, really, but peak yield is right at the start of that damn window. So. <laughs> um, the, the water supply situation in most of our environments, this is in Wagga Wagga, and Wagga Wagga is a good example. So it's mainly growing on winter rainfall with not great soils. But what you're finding is that its optimum yield will be achieved um, when the flowering time is around about the um, second week of October. But if there's a frost in the couple of weeks before that, um, you won't achieve that yield, that's for sure. 
Um, and if you flower much later than that, the heat will start to knock you around or you'll mature too fast. So, so this frost heat conundrum is really a, a major issue. And, and when you talk with the industry and, and the agronomists, there's a lot of frustration because, well, farmers are vary a lot in how risk averse they are and, and there's a lot of issues in or, or research in trying to manage frost particularly because there's a tendency for for growers to plant something that's a bit too late. And there are some growers who tend to, to gamble the house on plant flowering too early. And you can see why, because you want to be near the start of that window, but gee, you don't really want it to happen if there's a frost that year. And the unfortunate thing is that what happens this year has got nothing to do with what happens next year, um, and it can be a wipe you out no matter what. Is there any way to know further ahead in the likelihood of a frost? <sighs> well, we can predict the rainfall a bit better than we can predict the frost um, because of El Nino helps us with prediction a little. So we do have some seasonal forecasting that can lead us towards it. There's a higher probability of later frost during El Nino as well. So not only do you get drought, you get frost. And there's also a higher probability of heat. So you get all three. Well, in years where an El Nino is building like this one, although <coughs> I guess at the start we didn't really have to react to it because it, it sort of built a bit late, but it, the El Nino information is much more valuable for the summer crops, for sorghum. Um, but where you can use it for wheat particularly, I mean, the problem is that an El Nino says to you, you're going to have a high probability of low rainfall in your environment. And it may, it, sh it depends on where you are. It'll, the probability will shift by different amounts. Okay, so, the, so the f your first reaction is, oh, I should flower earlier so that I'm not out there so long and I don't use the water so fast. But the problem is if a frost risk goes up at the same time because you've got more clear nights, then flowering earlier is going to increase your risk of frost even if it decreases your risk of drought. So the kind of adaptation you might want is, oh, well, maybe I need to do something that saves water by planting a lower density or having a transpiration efficient wheat line and have a slightly later maturity to avoid the frost. So that's where you get into really tricky situations. <coughs> so what we can do now, and again, I'll talk more about this on Tuesday, and I should be looking at the time. Lee, how badly are we going here? <laughs> you want me to finish at five? Oh, yeah, but you want to you want to start at five, don't you? Ish. So I'll elaborate again a bit more on this on Tuesday. But we're able to to summarise results and in a production sense nationally and for a new site. So. What we're interested in doing is, with the, when the national variety trials come out, we would like to be able to simulate the new varieties and, and make forecasts on, where, on their flowering and sowing, sorry, their sowing and recommendations. We can predict these new genotypes. We can't estimate this earliness per se from the genes directly. We have to do an experiment to get that information. Um, what we'd like to do, uh, we want to improve prediction for earlier sowing dates. There's a tendency for farmers to push back into April, May now or in March even, with really crazy late maturing stuff because they're trying to get some more time to accumulate biomass. And there's been a change in the rainfall pattern so that there's a little bit more February, March rain in the south um, than there was 50 years ago. So there's been this sort of shift in the, the weather pattern. Um, we want to be able to um, augment the national variety trials. So at the moment, you know, there's a lot of recording of flowering date in the variety trials, but in the end, it's pretty useless information because it's not recorded well. We can actually predict it better than, than it can be measured, just because you can't visit a variety trial frequently enough to get really good flowering information. And we'd really like to be able to, to improve these predictions using SNPs and, and looking at alternative alleles um, for major minded genes. So. That's that story. And maybe if you have any questions, I can answer them. Because I might leave the QG one until later. So how do you predict flowering time? 
for these genotypes? Well, for, for all of the release materials, we know what their major gene, major alleles are, <coughs> and we've characterised their base thermal time response, which is the minimum flowering date you would get. We've turned that into a parameter because we've grown them under vernalizing photoperiod conditions, and so those ones we can predict. Um, for a new genotype, we just need to do an experiment to work out what that base thermal time is and, and what the major genes are. And it'll cover most things. What we're not picking up well at the moment is the minor vernalization and photoperiod genes. So uh, we, we've been able to do a little bit of work on that with some SNP work in an in a adapter wheat project, an EU project. So with Matthew Bogart, when he visited with me from INRA, we, we did some work on that. Um, and it indicated some of those minor genes. Um, but I haven't been able to do more of that work. There's some commercial constraints on some of it. So. How much do you think that would improve it, the, having those minor genes? That be where you're I don't know. Look, from a practical point of view, probably not huge amounts. I think just having that base period is, is enough for most of what we're doing. It, it's, it's probably more for uh, more like winter and facultative weeds, so we, we really would need to improve the model, I think. Yeah. Scott, Scott I just wonder if um, you were thinking maybe <coughs> you, you wanted to do maybe the UAV one? Yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah, I can do that. I was going to suggest exactly that. <laughs> so, you can be spared some torturous discussion on Q-gene simulation. We might skip over that. Maybe we'll let Mark present it on Friday. You know? <laughs> or, or we could, maybe we could slot it in for a quarter of an hour or so there. But let's, let's go with this one. <coughs> so actually, let's see if that thing loaded by now. Oh, oh, there you go. OK. So this is the height of every um, plot. Well, actually, every four or five centimetres in the field. Um, and don't worry about all those holes, because that was where we were cutting samples out, right? This is a modelling trial, so we were taking samples every two weeks. And the resolution we've got on canopy height, which I'll show you soon, is pretty good. It's, it's, in the, it's sub five centimetres. Um, so we can characterise a trial reasonably well with this. So, um, First, I want to do a, a, just show a couple of slides from a talk, which you can, if you're not sick of listening to me now, you can do some more tonight. <laughs> um, if you write that little address down there, or look for um, this extending the phenotype on the um, last year's ASA site. I gave a talk there on this work uh, with colleagues from, from CSIRO in particular, and with Graham. Um, it was mainly about crop modelling and integrating with phenotyping. And I'm going to show you a couple of slides from it, but just from a particular area <laughs> to show you some of the other technologies that, that CSIRO is mucking around with. So Xavier Soro, who runs the High Resolution Plant Phenomics Centre in Canberra, um, he's developing tools that are giving very high resolution analysis of plants in, in, in uh, these... Um, robotic systems, so they're, they're major advances, I think, on what you can buy commercially. Um, and in the field phenomics, I wanted to mention um, particularly the work from, from uh, Jose Jimenez Bernie, who came out of Pablo Zarco's lab in um, Cordova. And Bernie's really been the driver behind this phenomobile, which is a great bit of kit. Um, does a nice job. You follow it along. It does have a little motor on this wheel here. And Bernie's going to be here tomorrow presenting a poster. So if you want to ask him some questions about it, do that. He's got a really nice system running. Um, works pretty well. Uh, we're going to try and build one for Gatton, but we've got to put really fat tyres on it. Because we've got this vertisole that cracks like crazy. And it's about this wide in the cracks, which is about the width of those tyres. So um, we know that it won't work on our, our soil. Um, which is another reason why I like UAVs, so I'll show you some work on that. The other work that those guys do is in this, um, these wireless sensor networks. So, and I, 
<coughs> and particularly involved in this. We haven't really published much on it yet. Probably should hurry up. Um, they developed this really nice wireless sensor, which is based on a thermopile, like the one you would get in an infrared gun, um, with a wireless Arduino-based system. It's completely self-contained. That's what you put out in the paddock. And then there are these um, receivers which transmit over the 3G network straight back to a database system. And these monitor temperature every five minutes or so. Well, actually, every minute integrated every 15 minutes. So these are days here. And so the, the color that change that you're seeing here is the change in the normalized temperature for each genotype. So you can see these are genotypes that are staying cool. These red ones are genotypes that are getting hot. Um, we won't go into whether that's good or bad right here. <laughs> um, but, but you have one of these systems. It's monitoring an area of about, at, at, it's about one to one. So it, it's a 10 degree lens, I think. So when it's about 50 centimetres away, it's, it's monitoring a relatively sm small area, 20 centimetres or so across. And you leave it there for the whole season. And so we're in the process of validating a lot of this. But my, the, the, the way I want to see these working, and we've been working on, is that you might run a breeding trial where you might have 20 of these things, um, but then you use a vehicle or an, a UAV to measure your temperature on a much more regular, on an irregular basis, so every week or something like that. So these things are out there the whole season measuring non-stop. So they'll give you the entire pattern across the season, but then you would use some other vehicle to collect the entire field's data. Um, I already mentioned Bernie's poster. Um, so he's got a nice LiDAR running up here and he's building software um, to analyze cross-sectional LiDAR intercepts on, on wheat so that you can generate things like this. So these are leaf area profiles on a, a particular day for a contrasting wheat genotypes. So you can see the way that the leaf area is distributed. And they're also looking at ways of using the laser light because of the wavelength it is to estimate um, nitrogen content of the, the leaf. So then you could actually start to study the nitrogen distribution and how that might be influencing potential photosynthetic uh, or canopy photosynthesis. Anyway, so that's that one. Now I'll talk about the aerial platform stuff. Um, we did get around to publishing this last year in a slightly obscure journal. So if you look for Agronomy 2014, um, you'll find this. Um, type in MDPI and Phenocopter, you'll find it pretty fast. And this was a result of, I've been doing this since 2009 because this guy, Torsten, <coughs> here, Torsten Mertz, was uh, uh, a, he's a roboticist who completely built a robotic version of this helicopter. It's a quite lethal machine. It has a six foot radius on the blade. And at the time, so in 2009, you couldn't buy one of these cute little quad things that KSU love and, and I also use. Um, and so I was working with Torsten on this thing and he developed an entire flying system for this. Um, that, that controls it and basically it can fly real helicopters it, autonomously, so just like the little quads can. So we spent a fair bit of time working on this and, and in the paper you'll see all the elaboration of the workflow and everything that we had to think about. And most of what we focused on was single image processing. I'll show you some in a second. Not so much mosaic processing because the software, honestly, I really hate this, you know, you start doing something too early and you can't do it because the software is not good enough. I mean, I wanted to do this 20 years ago, but I couldn't do it then either. Um, but what we're finding is from these images, we can get quite good delineation of, of crop cover. For example, these are contrasting genotypes at two densities of wheat. Um, we can look at diurnal change in canopy temperature by flying multiple times. And the one that I really loved and, and is my favourite part of the paper was estimating lodging quantitatively for every plot in the field. And it's easy. Um, we didn't think it was. It, it wasn't even something that occurred to me when I was doing it. But when we started processing the data, we realised that that was actually probably the easiest thing to do. 
And then you started to see all the patterns in the lodge and you went, oh, mm, experiment design problem here. Why does it, well, as soon as that one falls over, all those fall over, but nothing falls over over there. So anyway. So for a single image analysis, this is a kind of flight you might have done. Here's a single image from the flight. And we wrote some software that required one of my casual student assistants to, to click on 250 photos per flight to chop all the plots out. And so I have this really great validation set um, from that work. And now we can mosaic it all, and I'm going to show you how we do that, or at least what happens when we do that in a second. So this is, this is when you process a single image um, through this custom system. So you have to adjust for a whole bunch of things to do with lenses and corrections and angles of helicopters and all that kind of stuff. So I want to show you some photo mosaic analysis. Now, I don't want to say that I'm promoting a particular piece of software, but I'm using Pix4D Mapper, if uh, that helps anybody know what one of the packages that seems to do the job that we need done. Um, it's not perfect. Um, there are a lot of problems, but this is a, 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 a shot of a wheat field that's been, that's a completely um, reconstructed um, shot, so it's not, in fact, I can show you. Uh, let's go to Dropbox. So, does anybody get dizzy? Because you might want to close your eyes if you do. Um, this is a flight around our virtual wheat paddock. And those white dots that you saw go past with the RG crop sensors. So this thing's completely reconstructed in the software, and I just put that flight in with about five clicks. It's just, it's not, it, it looks like I spent a lot of time doing it, but I didn't. It's quite easy. Um, but this is only a fun bit. The, the, the challenging bit is how do you extract all that data out for every plot? And that's the bit that we've just solved, I think, rather nicely. Um, so I'll show you some of that. <coughs> so this is a camera we're using at the moment, which is this Mikasense five-channel camera. Um, and it's, each one of those lenses is, you see it's taking a very narrow bandwidth to blue, green, red, red edge, and NIR. So the, when you buy a, a modified Canon or something from Max Max or something, you get a big chunk of, of each of these. You don't get a really fine colour. These are the different colours of one of the plots. So we're collecting this with the iris. This thing only weighs 150 grams, so we can, we can keep it well under four. Well, with the battery, uh, we're still under the weight limit we need to be for the iris. So um, then you can calculate uh, an NDVI um, using the NIR band and the, and the red band. So you can do that for every image if you want, but it's more interesting to do it for a mosaic. So here are the photo mosaics. So the flight takes 10 minutes, but generating each one of these takes about four or five hours on a computer with a stack of GPUs and everything. But the nice thing is that the people who make the camera are now offering this cloud service where you just send all the images and overnight you get the answer back. And then the processing I'm going to show you is processing that we've done on the result from the company's analysis. So we didn't even bother running it on our computers, I just had to upload it. So here's an RGB, here's an NIR picture. So in this trial has been a nice fun one to do it. We've got high nitrogen on this side, we put on about 250 kilos of N. On this side we didn't put, we put about 30 kilos. So the total in the soil here was only about 50 to 70, I think. Um, we irrigated this end of the field and the other end is rain fed. That photo um, was a bit earlier in the crop so you don't see much difference but you can, you can now. So here's an NDVI calculation. It's not very easy to interpret in that sense. Um, and here's an elevation. So you can see we've got a challenge here because the elevation of the field is, is um, lower at one end than it is at the other. So so even though we're measuring the elevation of the canopies, if we just analyze that data, we're going to have a trend right through the field. Now, we could remove it statistically, but it's more fun to remove it using the analysis we've got. Um, and I'll show you how we've done that. So here's an NDVI mosaic of the rain-fed low-end experiment. So 
All these yellow bits are where we've been cutting samples out. This is our final harvest plot. So the way we've done this is we took the mosaic and we had an, a, a, a CSV of our experiment design and we wrote some code that allowed us to just drop it straight on there. So we had to make four clicks on the mosaic to extract all the plot data, which is a lot better than what I had to do before, which was, I don't know, about 200, about 1,000 clicks if I was going to take them out of each of the, the pictures. And I've got five wavelengths here. So I think Jun would not have thanked me because he would have had to click on 5,000 images to, or 5,000 clicks he would have had to make. And I think I would have been up for an OHS um, RSI case or something just for one analysis. But we could get this analysis in, well, now that we've got it working, I think we can do it in uh, five or 10 minutes. So every pixel we calculate the NDVI at three centimeters. Um, just to zoom in on that, that's the, the level of, you can see the, the green is the plants, the yellow is the soil. It's not actually the soil, it's just the yellowing leaves that are intersecting lower down. So then you can pull that out. Um, I haven't done much filtering of this because we only just got this working uh, about a week ago, actually three days ago, um, this particular thing. So you can see that there's, there's quite a few outliers on the, the NDVI estimate, but this is for the high nitrogen. So you can see the NDVIs, the medians are around <coughs> 0.9. Um, on the low nitrogen rain fed, they're down around 0.8. And, and these are different genotypes, the box plots. Um, you can see clearly that this genotype Gregory is um, higher. It is actually about four or five days later in flowering time. So that's, that's definitely a phenology effect that's going on there. Um, but there's some contrast in here we've been playing around with these two genotypes here. Um, this is actually the same genotype in both cases, but this is this one, the, the lower one, we deliberately selected small seeds from the sample because we wanted to see what's the effect of seedling vigor on NDVI. And this is exactly the same seed source, but with a de deliberate sampling of small seeds. I can't remember the exact parameters. And we can see this in the low nitrogen. We can see this effect on the reflectance um, three months after they're planted. But under irrigation, you can't see it. It's not there. So under irrigation and high end, of course, it's gone. So those materials will probably yield the same, but here we'll probably see some difference. I expect to. Um, this is the canopy height. Um, Lee, this is the last kind of slide I'm up to. So what we've done here is, is we, we removed the soil surface from the whole thing. So if you imagine you've got a 3D picture of the whole field, like the one I showed you on the movie, um, what we've done is we've, we've written some code that lets us identify and remove the soil from underneath by, it's, like, it's just like subtracting a three-dimensional plane from the bottom. And these are the heights. And again, sorry about the size of the figures, but this is the irrigated trial, which this is not a really tall trial. You can see the median height is about 0.9 of a metre. Um, I know that's right because I went out there and it's on my, you know, the right height on my, my uh, belt measure. Um, this is the irrigated low nitrogen. You can see it's about 10 to 20 centimetres shorter. Here's the current status of the rain fed uh, high nitrogen, the rain fed low nitrogen, and they're only about 0.6, so they're down around there. So we're measuring those differences that we think we need to be able to measure in that trial. So obviously it took a while to settle this up, Scott, but uh, <coughs> once you've got it set up, I can sell it to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're working on trying to get that pipeline working because I made the comment, I've just been in the Weed Initiative meeting about platforms. I think one of the things that's held us back on phenotyping, I mean, one of the, is, is a lack of standardization in, in phenotyping. You know, it doesn't matter how wonderfully Matthew or, or me or anyone else can teach protocols. Everybody's still doing things differently because they're using different equipment and they're still doing, using different methodologies and different processing. Whereas in, in genetics, people go and get a SNP chip and yeah, we're all using the same chip and we're all getting the same answer. So 
I, I think that's a concept that's worth trying to pursue because, it, and I, again, I don't really want to recommend this camera particularly because um, uh, I'm not yet getting them to pay for my work, but maybe they will <laughs> if all you guys buy one. But the thing is that with this kind of setup, we can go and set, we can say, go and do a 50 metre height flight plan on that trial, submit your images to the website, and we know we will be able to process that data uniformly and perfectly. You just have to have your experiment design. You know, I think that's, so the secret is, yeah, for, well, no, yeah, for a small fee, a big fee, no. But I, I, think that's where, I think that's where it's heading is that, you know, you know, we've spent years trying to teach people how to do physiological profile uh, protocols the same way, but, you know, it's, it, it becomes limited because you were not able to replace the, the, the protocol with the equipment. And you think about um, genomics or, or molecular genetics, everybody was doing gels and they were getting different answers still. Well, they wouldn't admit it, but... <laughs> or RFLP is even worse. So, but, but once you've got to that SNP technology, you had a uniform protocol that was driven by the technology itself and you didn't have to worry about that. And so that's, I think that's a nice thing to try and aim at in phenotyping. So um, that's kind of a summary of, of how we see automated analysis. Um, and I think that's, uh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll mention at the end what we're working on. Matthew's dying to measure spike density. And we're pretty excited about this because we're working in, uh, as Graham would say, the ideal model crop of sorghum. Um, I tell you, sorghum is beautiful for phenotyping because it's got those big red heads sitting up by themselves and they're not too close together. So, so we've already developed some software that will, from images of sorghum, we can count the heads. Um, only because we don't get really, really, really high yields. So they're never actually completely blobbing them out. But we could, we could do it in a, in a high yielding crop as long as we measure at the right time. So, so we're pretty certain, and I've got some Japanese visitors coming who, who worked on this topic. Um, uh, we're, we're pretty certain we're going to get this working in sorghum. We're sure we'll get it working in sorghum. Don't know, watch this space on wheat. I think Matthew's right. You might need a combination of thermal and multispectral to do it in wheat, but we could get closer. And we think that we can do some of these other things here. Um, that become necessary to derive other phenotypes. So one of the nice things that the software does when you process these multi-spectral things is it's telling you the angle of every pixel. So every pixel is a chunk of leaf and it's working out what is the angle of every one of those based on the reflectance. And so then you can start to think about leaf angle distribution and deriving a bunch of things that you you might spend a lot on a phenomobile to do, but if we can do it in 10 minutes with a helicopter, I know which one I'm going to do. So, okay.